February of 1942, a B-25 bomber crew was given very unusual orders. They were stationed in California, and they were told to fly to Gary, Indiana. But on their plane was going to be a 2,000-pound dummy bomb, 1,150 gallons of aviation fuel. They were to fly through the Grand Canyon, not over the Grand Canyon, but through the Grand Canyon, and then after the Grand Canyon, they were supposed to try fly at treetop level all the way to Gary, Indiana. Now, all the time they were doing this, they were to monitor their two engines. They were checking every 15 minutes and writing it down, the manifold pressure, the cylinder head temperature, the carburation air temperature, hydraulic pressure, throttle settings, fuel mixture, prop settings, supercharger, headwinds, crosswinds, and even outside temperature. They wanted to find out what the B-25 bomber could do. At the same time, in Norfolk, Virginia, an aircraft carrier was leaving Norfolk. It had two B-25 bombers on it. It was on a USS Hornet. The Hornet was the newest aircraft carrier in the United States Navy at the time. She had just been commissioned in October of 1941 just almost three months before Pearl Harbor. She was in Norfolk when Pearl Harbor was attacked. But on that ship were two B-25 bombers. The crew were told that they were going to haul them, transport them all the way through the Panama Canal and take them to California. Much to their surprise, when the, two, when the aircraft carrier got out to sea, the two planes took off and flew back to land. These were the two tests that they used to find out if the B-25 bomber could go on the Doolittle raid. They just didn't know. A little side note, the USS Hornet was the youngest ship. One year and one day to the day it was commissioned, it sank in the South Pacific. Now, when they put those planes on that carrier, after they got to sea, they found out that some of those planes would not fly. They couldn't send a plane out to land to bring the parts for those planes, so they sent out a blimp. The ship was at sea. They sent out a blimp with the parts for that ship. The blimp caught up with the ship and slowly lowered down the parts for the rest of those planes. They wouldn't even fly. 132 days after Pearl Harbor, the Doolittle Raid was launched April 18, 1942. Sixteen planes took off that morning. Fifteen of them crashed in China. But one landed in Russia. Did you know that? She landed intact with her wheels down and everything else. And it still could be there today. The crew was held in Russia for almost a year. You see, Russia was not at war with Japan at the time. They didn't put them in prison, but they would not let them leave. So they were held in Russia for almost a year. That B-25 bomber could still be there today. No one knows what happened to that plane. If Russia used it, destroyed it, or used it in the war, they do not know what happened to it. Now, 14 entire crews made it back to the United States from that Doolittle raid. 14 entire crews. Some of them got back to the United States and did bombing raids in Europe. Some of them were shot down and killed. Some of them went to POW camps. Five of those pilots become generals in the United States Air Force. And one of them was, of course, Jimmy Doolittle. Jimmy Doolittle was born December 14, 1896. <coughs> he spent most of his youth in Nome, Alaska. He was born in the United States in California, but he spent most of his youth in Nome, Alaska, long before Alaska was a state. Doolittle was raised up there. He came back to the United States in 1910. He saw his first air show. He decided that's what he was going to do. Jimmy Doolittle was commissioned a first lieutenant of the United States Reserve Military Aviation Unit of the United States Army, March 11, 1918. 
Jimmy Doolittle graduated from the Cal University of California at Berkeley with a Bachelor of Arts degree. Jimmy Doolittle received a master's degree from MIT in 1924. In 1925, Jimmy Doolittle received a doctor's degree from MIT, the very first aeronautical engineering degree that was given in the United States of America. It was given to James Doolittle. James Doolittle was a very important factor in the development of instrument flying. In 1929, he was the first man in American history to take off and land strictly with instruments. Jimmy Doolittle was also the first man, it's never happened before in the United States Air Force. He went from first lieutenant to general, and he skipped two complete ranks. He went from first lieutenant to second lieutenant. He never was a captain. He promoted over that to a major. When Jimmy Doolittle was a lieutenant colonel, he was promoted again. He never was a full bird colonel. He skipped over that and went straight to general. Very unusual fellow. <coughs> Jimmy Doolittle married a woman by the name of Josephine Daniels in 1917. They were married for over 70 years. They had a dinner celebration at their house after the all-instrument flight. She had a white tablecloth on the table. And she asked every person there to sign that tablecloth. And then she embroidered every name in black. That became a tradition at the Doolittle house. They did that until Jimmy Doolittle retired. They had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of names on that tablecloth. That tablecloth today is in the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C. Jimmy Doolittle died at the age of 96. He's buried in Arlington, and of course, he received the Congressional Medal of Honor. Now, it's in your notes about who made the plan for the Doolittle Raid, Francis or Lowe. But you know, there were 80 men went on that cruise, on that flight. 80 men, five men on each plane. Today, there is one left. One. He's 101 years old, and he happened to be Jimmy Doolittle's co-pilot.